Well, delighted that you're here for our worship service. Take your Bibles, if you would, and join me in Proverbs 31. Let's pause for a a moment of prayer. And uh, by the way, you may have noticed that uh, we did not read from the New American Standard that I usually preach from. It's from the Legacy Standard Bible, and I I had to put a shout out to the translators this week when I saw in my own LSB that every letter of the Hebrew alphabet is used in this acrostic. Uh, It's it's just a beautiful poem that we we get to study this morning, and so it's... uh, uh, we need the Spirit of God to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. Father, we come to you again asking that you would use your word and speak your truth into our lives that we might comprehend it and that we might see what it looks like with shoe leather on it as we seek to be doers of your word, not hearers only. And God, as we look at this subject together, we understand that there are, are some of our our friends and family in this church and other places of the globe who this is the first Mother's Day without mom. Might your sovereign spirit uh, comfort them as only you can do. We think of moms who uh, can't have kids, can't see their kids, those who've lost a child, those doing caretaking. Thank you for the gift of reaching out to orphans and to Uh, be able to uh, go through adoption. Think of those who can't have kids. Lord, help us to come alongside, always knowing how we can shore up those that are downtrodden and point them one step to the right towards Christ-likeness. Thank you that you are all sufficient. And God, give us godly moms at Grace Bible Church who fear you above all earthly fears. We'll be cautious to give you all the praise. In your son's name, amen. Well, beloved, I'd like to preach to a sermon that I've titled, A Wise Woman Who Fears the Lord, from Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 31. And before any of you young men tune out, what follows in our exposition is a portrait of what you ought to be attracted to and have on your list for what you're looking for. Before you older ladies tune out, remember what Titus 2 instructs the church on coming alongside younger ladies to help them develop these virtues. And young ladies, these are things you ought to aspire to and beg in prayer for God to develop this godly fear and help you flesh out in a very practical manner. It's exciting how that even passages that are specifically focused on certain groups have an edifying value far outside its purview. Solomon could just as rightfully be talking to the men as he uses the women, the, the women who fear God, wives in this case, who fear the Lord. He's been talking all through the book of Proverbs about biblical wisdom and the fear of Yahweh. You see, we live in an ungodly world that is filled with those who don't fear God. You know, earlier on in the book of Proverbs, back in chapter, again, I didn't bring my preaching Bible. I wanted to use the LSB, but in in chapter 4, verse 20, Solomon's been saying to his son, Pay attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Don't let them deviate from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all his flesh. He says to his young son, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. But Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, there's some concentrated sections on sexual purity and how we are to behave in this fallen, sinful world. When you get to chapter 5, notice how he begins Proverbs 5, 1, My son, pay attention to my wisdom, like he said in the previous chapter. Incline your ear to my discernment, that you may keep discretion and that your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech, but her end is bitter as wormwood. 
sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol, lest she watch the path of life. Her tracks are unstable, and she does not know it. The strange woman of Proverbs has an unstable path, and don't think that you can take fire to your bosom and not be burned. Over in the seventh chapter, Solomon reiterates, My son, keep my words. Treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you're my sister. And call understanding your intimate friend in order to keep you from the strange woman, from the foreign woman who flatters with her words. You know, the immoral woman of Proverbs, Solomon was trying to guard his son from. It wasn't like his son didn't have the same totally depraved heart. But Yahweh needs to be at the helm of life. If there's anybody to teach us in the way of life, it's one who messed it all up. God gave Solomon wisdom like no other earthly man. And probably in the latter years is when he came back to honoring the Lord after he became a poster child to his son. Don't be like dad. You know, the world misses the mark. You ever track all the hype associated with, say, for example, the Miss America pageant? You know, it's held annually. It's open to women from the U.S. between the ages of 17 and 25. Much emphasis on outer beauty. And it's not that outer beauty and outer attraction isn't important because you want to have some kind of physical attraction. But that's going to all turn to baldness and budges and bulges and wrinkles and wrinkles and all the stuff that happens as we age. No matter how much youth youth we get out of a tube. So it's not inner beauty, biblically defined. You know, and so in these pageants they're discussing women who are worthy of honor. Well, what kind of woman does God honor? The answer is found in the concluding chapter of the book of Proverbs. Chapter 31 begins with the wise king, verses 2 to 9, which we won't look at today, but then the excellent wife, verses 10 to 31. Both are teachings of a godly mother. When you get to Proverbs 31, we're told in the first verse the words of King Lemuel, the oracle unto which his mother disciplined him. And she tells him about the wise king and the wise woman. Lemuel, which is... His only mention in the Bible is assumed by most to be Solomon, as the ancient Jewish tradition identifies him as such. He's warned not to spend strength. That same Hebrew term, hayil, is used later on in verse 10 for the wife. She's to be a strong woman. We'll look at biblical strength. Here the emphasis is on virility and energy. This warning is the animated burst from the heart of a mom in verse 1 to instruct her son, to protect her son as she sends him out into the world. These forbidden gratifications against God's law is what ruined kings. Solomon's sin destroyed his kingdom. The fruit of this sin is shame and the end of it without repentance is death. So Proverbs ends with this acrostic poem where each letter of the Hebrew alphabet is used on each line describing an excellent wife. You know, being a wife, being a mom in Old Testament expectation of the family, there are rare exceptions. It's not that everyone has, there's not a whole lot of people in life that have the gift of singleness that the Bible talks about. Most people get married. What does it mean to be a Christ-exalting husband? What does it mean to be a Christ-exalting wife? Well, a godly woman is one who fears the Lord. And such a tool is made memorable through an acrostic as it gives the description of a worthy woman. You know, biblical wisdom is something that is practical. It's 
defined as skin, skillful living. Those that were coming out on Wednesday for our thematic study of the book of Proverbs learned the definition of wisdom that in most ways it's defined as skillful living to the glory of God. So when the Bible addresses wisdom, it's not an IQ issue, aren't you glad? Uh, it speaks of heart attitudes with God at the helm of life as it's worked out into a lifestyle. Solomon talks about a societal wisdom that's generous and benevolent and has a reputation. He addresses sexual wisdom. Wisdom for godly relationships and friendships. Wisdom of, of having a humble teachability that turns at the reproofs of life. A wise person is known by their words. How do they speak? It's also known by whether they're taming the temper and having temperance when it comes to issues like alcohol. Wisdom is known by how it works, not by how sluggish and lazy it is. And so this wisdom book of the Old Testament climaxes in the wise woman who fears the Lord. We want to examine the biblical ideal for womanhood, which runs so countercultural. Because while our society is trying to obliterate the distinctions between men and women, Proverbs 31 describes a wife whose life is centered on serving her Lord by being a helper to her husband. You go back to the book of beginnings in Genesis 2.24. God made woman to be a comparable helper to her man for a lifetime. So friends, notice the five stands of poetic truths to see the portrait of a virtuous wife and exemplify such virtues. What characterizes a God-fearing woman? You know, that term wife, ish, in the Hebrew is the same word that is trans translated as woman. And context distinguishes whether we're being speaking generally of women or more particularly of wives, which most women in the Old Testament were, you one, you the other. We see, first of all, the description of her marriage in verses 10 to 12. As usual, there's an outline in the back of your bulletin. I will not reread the whole text that was read during our scripture reading, but as we go along, we'll remind ourselves. He says in verse 10, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above pearls. The description starts in the home because the ideal woman, as one put it, is not found in a convent separated from the world, but in a home with a husband, children, and dirty laundry. That's right, entity. He starts off by talking about this excellent wife. The term hail means strong or wealthy, competent. The Hebrew phrase is also used to describe the woman Ruth. I don't remember how long ago, a year, year and a half ago. Sometime in the last two years since I've been here, we studied the book of Ruth. She is one of these gals who fits many of the characteristics of the ideal wife described in Proverbs 31. You know, she was hardworking and took initiative, Ruth 2.2. 2. She was praised in the gates, Ruth 4.11. That, that Hebrew term, hayel, can also indicate strength and wealth, courage. Uh, the New American Standard uses the word worth. New English Bible, ability. And so we start the section with a question. An excellent wife, who can find? That, my friend, is the right question. She actually does exist. She's just hard to find. Not a lot of them. This is where implicit faith in our sovereign God comes to play. Him who is all wise, his wisdom trumps our fallen logic every time. Every day of the week, twice on Sunday. So he's all wise, all powerful over the events of life and our present quandaries. And so we're to wait upon the Lord. The verse emphasizes the scarcity or rarity of such women. Don't be in such a, such a pucker to get married to somebody you're going to spend decades with 
if they don't fear the Lord. You know, her worth is far above pearls. She's scarce. My pastoral encouragement to the young or the old as you wait on the Lord for His provision is confident trust. Wait for Mr. or Mrs. Wright without compromising. His timing is perfect. He'll work it out together for our good and for His glory, Romans 8.28. It's worth the wait. She's worth the wait. You know, pearls of coral is how precious and valuable. So he says that the heart of her husband trusts in her. Trust in God puts our confidence in others in perspective. That we fear God before we fear man. We trust Him over our trust in man. That brings it in perspective, does it not? That the same sovereign God at work in my heart, which can't be seen by mortal man, is the same God at work in her life, progressively sanctifying her affections, her speech, her desires, and her actions. Being confident in this very thing, Paul writes to the Philippians, that he which began a good work and you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If God's not going to give up on your sanctification, He's not going to give up on your mate's sanctification as well, even though, even though that it's very progressive and slow process. So you wait and trust. Our ultimate trust is in God, knowing that we live with fellow sinners who will breach our trust, thus the need for constant forgiveness. Here, the husband doesn't maintain some jealous guard over her, acting as some control freak that has to micromanage his wife. Knowing that she's going to do things different from me. This is, though, the covenant of marriage. She's got my back, I got hers. In other words, his valuables aren't locked up, giving her no access. Which went against the common ancient practice in a house of distrust, thinking that she'll sell the clothes off his back. You know, she'll demonstrate impeccable loyalty. You know, her thrift and industry will add to his wealth. Practically, the foundation of this trust is good, clear communication. You know, when I'm in counseling with a, a couple and you got the, the bonehead brilliant guy who thinks he doesn't need to, you know, he's working late and doesn't need to call and let his wife know who's about to burn the biscuits and in a panic wondering where you've been. Where you been. You know, honey, I'm headed out for errands. Hope to be back in an hour. Or when you're done work, love, I ought to be home in about 45 minutes but need to stop and get my weed eater from the shop, leaving no room for a wandering mind and being a person of your word. So trust is essential ingredient in any marriage. Yeah. He and she are not flirtatious or immodest. Don't gossip or reveal secrets to others. You trust her with your money. Don't threaten a whole lot to cut up the credit cards, right? Now this was Luther's description of his wife. The reformer said, the greatest gift of God is a pious amiable spouse who fears God and loves his house and with whom one can live in perfect confidence. It's not, not characteristic. You've got work to do. We've all, we're all in process. We started in marriage because an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who shames him is like rottenness to his bones. We read in Proverbs 12.4. In other words, she's not merely a sex object or a maid and a cook, but a woman of virtuous character that compels her to be a capable manager, a teacher, an entrepreneur, and all the while living that home-centered life. Point number two is the largest part of this section, the largest section of our sermon. Verses 13 to 24, the description of her behavior. If you notice all the verbs, when you're studying the Bible, 
go to the verbs to see where the action is. She's dedicated to her husband. All she says, all she does is meant to support, to build up, to encourage, and to affirm him. Life is hard enough for a man who makes his way in the world without adding to that burden. A wife who doesn't understand or support. So in verse 11 begins the actual catalog of her activities, her actions in this detailed account of what fills the hours of her day and days of her week. This is basically a kind of a general personal journal of what the day looked like. Well, a good part of her day is buying raw materials, spinning, weaving, sewing. Verse 13, she searches for wool and flax. The excellent woman gathered the material for making the clothes. She couldn't just go to the store. We, we get so accustomed to our modern contrivances. It's easy. Not then. Well, she's looking for wool and flax. Verse 14, she's likened to the merchant ships. The excellent woman would go far to secure the best food for their families. Shopping's a daily duty. You know, they didn't have refrigeration like we do. They probably didn't have overstuffed pantries like we do where we can go to Costco and spend an obscene amount of money to get us over the next several days. It's a daily thing. It's hard for us to comprehend in our microwave and prepackaged age how hard life was. You know, part of the pain and the difficulty of doctoring a body back from the grave that I went through about eight-ish years ago when I almost died. I came back from seeing the alternative care doctor that got me out of the daily pain and off the floor. And I had to radically overhaul my diet to get off all the 12 medications the doctors had me on to keep me going. And that first Monday, my wife and I cooked and cried more that day than we did previous years of our marriage together as no more prepackaged and boxed stuff that is instant and easy. So I got a little inkling as to what it must have looked like. We live in a box, boxed age, bagged food that could be fixed in a jiffy. All of a sudden, that's off my option. You know, even in our day, you can get those MREs and you can live for months. Just add water, right? We don't have to cut the wood for a wood-fired stove. We don't have to plant the wheat. We don't have to grind the wheat. We are reading an old book of years gone by with all the hard work that elicited gratitude. Boy, when you've done everything to prepare the food and you sit down to din-din time, it's precious when it's been your own hands put it all together. You don't need to wonder about if you go out to eat and uh, who sneezed on your food and didn't wash their hands as they fix your victuals in the restaurant. Right? Look at her in verse 15. She rises while it is still night. In order to have food prepared for the family each day, she had to rise before dawn to begin work which she did gladly. First up, to fix breakfast and instruct the servants. Verse 16, she is plotting and considering a field. In order to have uh, the right place, she's pondering, she's planning. Doesn't just happen, it's intentional. She's resourceful and entrepreneurial in her investing and reinvesting in real estate. It would take money earned to reinvest in a vineyard. She's not sitting back eating the bonbons. Not like any of you do, but we're just seeing what he's got to say to us here. He, has, he looks at her strength in verse 17. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She didn't need to go to the gym to make her arms strong, just carrying a toddler around while you're doing all this gardening and all this fixing is enough. You know, such women were not soft. 
but by virtue of rigorous work, they were strong. She was energetic and enthusiastic participant in life. In verse 18, she senses her gain is good. That which she produced for her family of clothing and food and wealth was good and profitable. There's an old Russian proverb that says, quote, there are two fools in the market. One asks too much and the other too little. Not this woman. She knew what was the best price to be had as she's, uh, 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 the word's escaping. Uh, uh, we don't dare use the word jewing down when we're preaching, right? Uh, she, she's uh, uh, bargaining. Yes, thank you. Uh, as words escape my, my tongue. She knows the value of things and demands the right price for goods. You know, and not to dote on my bride too much behind the pulpit, but in her resale business, she asked me, what do you think I'd ask for this? Like, I don't know. You know this stuff better than I do. This is, this is your wheelhouse. Take it and go. You know, verse 18, her, uh, her lamp doesn't go out. Now, there's a, a difference of interpreters here. When you, when you look at the various commentators and what they've got to say, what is this? Is this literally her lamp doesn't go out? She's up that late? Or is it speaking figurative? Well, you're, you're planting the vineyard during the day, verse 16. You're weaving late at night, verse 19. You're rising early before dawn, verse 15. I think it's speaking to the issues of diligence with her time and using it effectively, taking advantage of, of those quiet moments. You know, I think of moms of our day who, when they've got little ones, it's very energy intense, very time intense. It's like, how am I going to find time for devotions? Well, be like one of those, uh, I don't remember if it was, uh, who, uh, is it Susanna Wesley that had so many kids and she couldn't find a quiet moment, so she'd just throw her apron up over her head and spend a little moment praying, reorienting her heart, and kids knew don't mess with mom. She's, have, she's readjusting her attitude in prayer, you know, and so don't mess with her. But she can manage that to the glory of God. Because she's depending. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. You know, her schedule would make most blush as it's before sunrise to after dark to care for her household, which was the foremost priority of her life. This is what we have lost in our, our day and age. When you come to the New Testament, you say, well, that's just for a, a different day of a different time. One of the timeless truths that, where was I going? Oh yeah, uh, Titus. In uh, Titus 2, the church is reminded what this looks like in our continuing contemporary society. In Titus 2 and verse number 3, the Apostle Paul said, Older women likewise, they're to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they might instruct the younger woman in sensibility to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be slandered. A lot of biblical counselors have noticed that some homemakers have been prone to depression, depressing times because they've got less structure in their lives and they just can't keep up with it all. When you let your Walk with Jesus slip for your walk with your family. Priorities are awry and you will not survive to the glory of God. When there's too much time on the hands, lacking structure, there can be very easily a waste of time. But this woman, she's, she's organized, she's diligent. Long before social media, even social tea time, was cautiously scheduled around the priorities once they were taken care of. You look in verse 19 here. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands hold fast the spindle. Tools used to turn wool into thread for making clothing. Verses 20 to 24, you see more of her activity. She's driven by 
the priority of caring for her family, which results in a manifold of ways. The poor and needy benefited. Her own household benefited. Herself benefited. Her husband benefited. And tradesmen benefited. So let's just pull over and park for just a moment. Five fronts of life's intersection here. Notice, first of all, in verse 20, the needy who benefited from this wise woman. Don't pass over it too quickly. She's not so tied up with her own household that she forgets the needs of others. She's not myopic in her focus. It seems in the text that she's rather wealthy and she's not such because she's selfish and stingy, but because God blesses her generosity. If we were to spend some time and develop biblical stewardship on the fly, the first principle of biblical stewardship is cultivating a heart of generosity. Don't worry about how we're going to keep on keeping on if we ignore those less fortunate. It comes out in the wash in God's economy. God blesses her generosity. That's one of the foundational principles of stewardship. She's the walking, talking, giving epitome of Proverbs 11.25 that says that the generous man will be prosperous and he who waters will himself be watered. We look at the grocery bill. I have all I can do to feed my family. But in God's spreadsheet, you have that column for benevolence ministry. She's taking care of the needy. She's trusting God. She's not being frivolous. Second of all is her household. Verse 21. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. You know, snow indicates the cold that occurred in the high altitude of Palestine. You know, on my way to drive into church this morning, I saw that all the mountains were covered by a fresh blanket of snow, and here we are, May whatever, 7th or 8th. But don't miss this. Her labors anticipated her family's need for warm clothing in such cold places and seasons. She's planned ahead. She's got foresight. Deferred gratification on these items. You may not use them a whole lot. It's not like you wear a winter jacket all year long, but when you need it, you need it. You know, this would be the wisdom of even an emergency fund. You don't plan on the car breaking down or for your wild salmon at Costco to jump up $20 more a bag. You've got to plan ahead for that stuff. You know, I'd already mentioned she's home-centered. But I'd just add, she, she ignores the screeching feminists who accuse her of wasting her life and claim that she needs to get out of the home to amount to anything. Instead, she emulates the Lord Jesus in serving her home. Him who came not to be served, but to serve and give His life a ransom for many. She's marching after his, the, the beat of His drum. She tends to the needy. She tends to her household. Doesn't mean she doesn't take care of herself. Verse 22. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. You know, the efforts she makes to honor others are rewarded to her. You see, silk and purple garments are expensive evidences of the blessings returned to her by God's grace, doing it His way. Yeah, this is a twice doubling. You know, there's enough. She plans ahead. Even the rarest emergency didn't catch her off guard. So there's skill. There's industry. Wise investments are the payoff as God rewards the hard work. This is the lavish provision from a sovereign Lord working through the obedient servants who take responsibility serious. You can't figure it all out. You just figure out what God says and do it. Tend to the needy, tend to the household, tend to yourself. You know, if we were to exegete the white areas here a little bit and apply a little sanctified speculation, what would the world look like without women? Visit a bachelor pad someday and see how he lives and eats and dresses when the ladies aren't around. Mama hasn't been there to do her fluffing and make it look presentable and homey. 
You know, this gal goes beyond the basic essentials in dress and food prep and home decor. She cooks meals that are tasty, healthy, even color coordinates as she brings the woman's touch, decorating a home, filling it with interesting sights and smells. She takes care of her own outward appearance, including her clothing, verse 22. Her body, so that her husband can find delight in her beauty, back to uh, chapter 5, where he's just so awestruck that God would give him a woman for a lifetime of ministry. The needy, the household, herself. How about her husband, verse 23? Her husband's known in the gates when he sits with the elders of the land. Your public business was conducted at the city gates. She's made a significant contribution to her husband's position in the community and his success. His domestic comfort promoted his advancement in public honor, making his home his palace. This is his good reputation. Oh, you're him. Yeah, we heard about you. She raves on you. You know, when you come to qualifications of leadership in the local church, as we pray for God to continue to raise up godly male leadership in the home and in the church, come to 1 Timothy 3, be considering shepherds of the flock. Well, you better make sure that they've already managed their own home well before they manage the household of God. Big part is her partnership in the ministry. And finally, tradesmen, verse 24. She makes linen garments and sells them and gives belts to the tradesmen. You know, with all her other responsibilities faithfully discharged, she took time to make items of clothing for the purpose of trade. Both home and industry. Does whatever she can to generate income, not to chase after the almighty buck, but just to help alleviate the pressure of provision. You know, I think of so many industrious homemakers of this day that I'm aware of. They may not bring in big checks like the husband for the mortgage, but does help take the pressure off and make ends meet through their frugality and ingenuity and industry, constantly highlighted in this text. So as we move, we move from all this flurry of activity and work, Dear friends, understand that it flows out of a heart of wisdom. You can't get there without it. She is a God-fearer. Just like in, if you study the book of Ephesians, you see that there are two very clear parts. An outline of, of Ephesians, chapters 1 through 3, is the glory of redemption poured out on sinners such as us. Who we are in Christ, to be in Christ is to have all the spiritual blessings in heaven. You get to chapter 4, 4 through 6, rapid imperatives. Command, do this, don't do that. And so you tie in the imperatival commands in the second half of the book to who we are in Christ. Because if you're not in Christ, you can't benefit from any of that. You can't accomplish any of this of God's glory. This woman who's industrious and has an effect on our home and on society is all because she's a God-fearer. You know, we, we work because of who we are in Him. With God at the helm of life, she follows Yahweh. His wisdom affects all that she is, all that she does. So point three is the emphasis on her character, verses 25 to 27. This may be a shorter spot allotted, but don't under, underestimate the extreme significance. Notice three aspects. In verse 25, we see her strength and dignity. Strength and majesty are what she wears. It's her clothing. And she smiles at the future. So these words describe the character of a woman who fears the Lord. Her inward clothing displays divine wisdom, giving her confidence to face the future with all of its unexpected challenges. And she, she smiles at the future laughing at the days to come, so to speak. That's not to say that she trusts in her riches, but this is born of right and wise living. She's, she learned from the ant to store up food for the winter. That's why her family's got clothing. Plan ahead. Strength and dignity. 
is our clothing so that no matter what's coming down the pike, she smiles at it. Takes it in stride. You know, huddle up here. You know, she spins, she weaves, she buys, she sells fields, she helps the poor, she provides for her family. But notice her mouth in verse 26. It's always wise and productive. She opens her mouth and there's teachings of kindness. Her teaching of wisdom and the law. Even back in the first verse of our chapter, these are the words of a mother for her son. This is what you need to search for in life. The God-fearing life. Now we understand that dads kind of set the pace and take the initiative to be spiritual leaders, but mom is with the kids a lot more of the training time during the day and the, the power of a righteous tongue, one that is gentle. It gives a godly example, sisters. Let's follow in. You know, the, the house that she's building is not, not torn down with that tongue. J. Adams in his New Testament Proverbs, New Testament and Proverbs translation, he says she's not a, a dull drudge. She's spiritually and intellectually astute. She's righteous and self-controlled. There's a, a whole multitude of proverbial truths that we can study about on the tongue. That it's gentle. She's not a talebearer. She fears and reveres God in her heart, so produces words that please God. She's got a redeemed speech, in other words, offering words of wisdom. When her mouth opens, there's God's wisdom. Kindness, the term is hesed, God's love to God. And God's love to neighbor comes out of those lips. So strength and dignity, words of wisdom. Thirdly, as a skilled manager of the home, she, according to verse 27, she doesn't eat the bread of idleness, sluggishness. This verse goes with the previous. When there's too much time on your hands, this tongue is tempted towards wagging. Too much talk. So she doesn't eat the bread of idleness. L literally, it, it means eyes looking everywhere. You ever, ever be doing yard work or housework, whatever we're doing, and you've got somebody holding up the wall, and they're just content to watch you? That's the picture here. That she doesn't have eyes looking everywhere as the lazy man does. There's so much to do, there's no time to be idle. So we pray for endurance and enabling, both spiritual nourish, nourishment for his soul in her devotions as her body keeps going. Well, we've got the description of her family, point four, verses 28 and 29. Notice them again. Her children rise up and bless her. As for her husband, he also praises her saying many daughters have done excellently, but you have gone above them all. You know, she, she receives the highest reward from children who call her blessed and the humble who, uh, husband who praises her. Is there any other better commentary on this woman's work and worth than these sincere words of tribute? The blessing she seeks is her husband's praise and her children's respect. So no, a little note, guys. This passage does remind us of our duty to offer encouragement such that a woman desires from her husband, her children. He says you excel them all. Verse 29. What a portrait. We got the description of marriage, description of her behavior, description of her character, description of her family life. And so this whole summary in verses 30 and 31, a summary of her spiritual life. Now again, notice the amount of space allotted to it. It seems kind of disproportionate. He said so much about her flurry of activity, and yet what is at the end of the chapter really ought to be at the beginning of the chapter. The fear of God. Why is kindness on her tongue? Because she fears God. 
and she dare not speak otherwise to dishonor her Lord. So what comes last ought to come first. And maybe you're with us this morning and you're, you're sitting here and you haven't come all the way to faith in Christ. And there's a whole lot of fear that characterizes your, your, your heart because you don't know where you're headed when you die. C.H. Spurgeon said, Worldlings, in other words, unbelievers, may well be afraid for they have an angry God above them, a guilty conscience within them, and a yawning hell beneath them. But we who rest in Jesus are saved from these through rich mercy. So if that's you today, flee to Christ. Turn from your sin and embrace Christ today as your Savior. He is more willing to forgive you your sin than you are to repent of it. If you've got questions, talk to us. Once you learn how to fear Yahweh, come to Him in repentant faith, that fear of God begins to unpack. It's like a fine wine that grows better with age. Spurgeon goes on to say that the fear of God is the death of every other fear. Like a mighty lion, it chases all other fears before it. So the wise woman of Proverbs doesn't care if her house doesn't match up to the identity that other women think it ought. She's fearing God, and if she can please God, she doesn't care what man says about it. Because you're always going to have the naysayers. So verse 30 is that capstone on her noble character. She might be charming. She might be beautiful. But her real beauty rests in her total commitment to God. You know, praise the benefits here. She shall be praised. What's Solomon's conclusion to the book of Ecclesiastes? After he's tried wine, women, and wealth. Hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments. That's what life's all about. This woman's learned that. Her husband's attachment to her is well-founded. Not on deceitful and vain charms of beauty, but the fear of Yahweh. So the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet begins the last verse concerning this woman. Let her works praise her. Notice this. What she does, not what others say about her, makes her the most noble woman of all. And yet her husband and her children file in line praising the noble wife and mother a godly woman who fears the Lord. Beloved, I think that parents ought to instruct their children in this acrostic poem we find in verses 10 to 31. The better we come to grips with it, the more true biblical beauty will be understood and felt and manifest the gospel of transformed hearts in our midst. He begins to flesh out the brilliance of the godly woman who's married. She seeks the best for her husband. She's industrious and hardworking as she takes care of her household. She finds success in a variety of fields. She's generous to the impoverished. She teaches wisdom. Her children and husband praise her because her excellence surpasses all other known women in their estimation. And most importantly, she fears Yahweh and should be publicly recognized and praised for that. And so we do that today. Chalk it up to Hallmark Holiday if you want. We don't call out women today because Hallmark tells us to. We do so because the Bible tells us to. So thank you, moms, who pursue Christ, who make him known as you adorn the gospel of God's graces. Bishop Pilkington said, if, if, if women want to learn what God wants them to do and be occupied with, although they be of the best sort, let them read the last chapter of Proverbs. Or well, the old Puritan commentator Matthew Henry, in his quaintly style, says, Thus is shut up this looking glass for ladies, which they are desired to open and dress themselves by. And if they do so, their adorning will be found to bring praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Unquote. So godly women don't succeed on their own strength. Notice that connection of the fear of the Lord that he ends with. Because of the fall of man into sin, virtue doesn't come naturally. Women 
may be tempted to abandon their roles as helpers and may desire to dominate their husband. That's what we're told in Genesis 3.16. But the woman who turns to God in faith is forgiven of her sin. She receives this new nature. So often women complain, I'd be an excellent wife if I just had a better husband. And yet the wise woman's service to her husband is not based on his worthiness, it's based on the worthiness of Christ. When she renders respectful submission, she does so as unto Christ. The virtuous woman, in essence, doesn't put her ultimate trust in man, not even her husband. She serves God in her home with the strength that God alone supplies. Even if the world or family doesn't put the godly woman on a pedestal, God sure does recognize her worth and so should we. So young people, married men, encourage your excellent wife. Acknowledge her as a gift from God's hand. Single guys, seek this woman of excellence. Many young men are attracted to young ladies primarily because of outward charm and beauty. Why don't you measure a woman according to her spiritual worth unfolded in Scripture? Charming, beautiful women are a dime a dozen and can be found virtually anywhere. But a virtuous woman is a rare gift from God. A prudent wife is from the Lord. Proverbs 19, 14. Would you pray with me? God, thank you that you school us in so much biblical theology of what wisdom looks like all through the book of Proverbs how we deal with wine, how we deal with women, how we deal with wealth, how we deal with our words. And the capstone of this book of wisdom is this excellent woman who fears you. God, help us to be God-fearers in word and in deed, both men and women alike. For your glory we ask it. Amen. Our last hymn.